This is Patricia Windrow at the Cable Easel, bringing you a program devoted to painting and drawing from life. Today, working from a monitor because we went out and did a shoot today. The sun was very beautiful and um, I'm going to be working from a monitor over there, which is the closest that we can get uh, to the out of doors. So uh, if anybody has a video camera of their own, they can go out and shoot a tape for 15 or 20 minutes and then come back and play it on their VCRs and you've got a landscape in front of you. There is going to be some activity on the screen because there are ducks and swans and all sorts of things going on out there, which makes you realize that we are working from something live as opposed to a still life or a picture, a photograph, a still photograph. And this is a place called Little Bay in Setauket. It's a, it uh, connects with Setauket Harbor by a very narrow inlet. And um, in the winter time, it freezes over sometimes very uh, often, and boats do harbor in there. It's a safer harbor in there than in the Setauket Harbor. And so with some uh, tinted turpentine on the end of my very fine brush, I'm going to be using some raw umber as an ink, kind of, in order to uh, do my layout. And uh, I begin on a, on a grade canvas for, merely for transmission uh, excellence because uh, a white canvas doesn't do very nice things. So here is the beginning of a layout for this kind of landscape painting, which is actually landscape and seascape combined. There is the farthest line that I, that I see. And directly uh, below that is what you might just call the, ho the horizon line. This is the, um, the horizon line is the part that's almost always the flattest. These are usually land masses that come and interrupt the uh, f distance. So uh, with, a, with that kind of uh, the, the two lines, we have now a composition with just two lines. Uh, something that I always like to point out that when people talk about composition and become very intimidated by it, I can show you that with a, mi with a minimum of 10 lines, you can have a complete composition. And working from life, I'm showing you how you pick out these particular color patterns. Here is the, here is the, the uh, kind of a suggestion of the shape that is in the foreground of this, of this um, area. And anybody sitting out there would be able to see that these shapes are proportionately correct. Here is uh, a third line. So we now have a diagonal, which makes all compositions more interesting. Diagonals are in essential in landscape painting. Otherwise, you have what might be called ribbon pictures, just sky, land, and then foreground. So uh, the diagonals are the thing that gives you the third dimensional quality. And then we have here another kind of an interruption or the beginning of a, of a low tide area, which forms another little pool. So with a maximum of now, we have one, two, three, four, five, six lines, and the composition is just about all that is needed to be set. Naturally, there are the details. The detail of the house that is in the distance, that is placed approximately here. The mast of the boat is way over to the left of the composition. And the boat sits very high in the harbor because it's close to the land and it's far away. So there would be the layout, the small details. I'm going to be working today in palette knife, one of my very favorite uh, mediums because uh, the chances of getting muddy colors are very, very much less when you use a palette knife because as you can see it's shining which means that it is super clean. It has no hairs that can trap color. And I'm using a palette of 
Well, I didn't count the colors, but I usually use a 12 to 15 color palette. Uh, the programs that tell you to use four colors and five colors is, um, is limiting your possibilities. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, exactly. I have 15 colors. Uh, many of them are basic and primary and always more white than any. The business of palette knife painting uh, should be very clearly uh, talked about that you that um, in my opinion the no-no is to um, is to have badly mixed colors on the canvas as you can see I want to make sure that this color is thoroughly mixed before I start applying it to the canvas um, the uh, reason for that is that when you rely upon uh, uh, the flat areas uh, having texture, they don't. The sky, when we shot this today, was absolutely uninterrupted blue. Uh, hence, I'm go that's exactly what I'm going to do, an uninterrupted blue. No smears, no accidental um, uh, lines, just, just blue. And uh, it may seem like a... Uh, oversimplification, but I think that that is what has to be done when you're teaching this kind of painting, that you must simplify. The, uh, the details are wonderful, they can come by later, but as you can see, just applying with this um, a palette knife, just applying the base color, uh, not only uh, accommodates the need to work very quickly when you're out of doors, because you're dealing with something called time and the sun, and the sun tends to move uh, without any um, delay, it is going to do what it does. And if you don't work quickly when you're out of doors, you're going to find that your subject matter has suddenly changed so that you can't really continue with it and you must go back the next day. That's why working with small canvases such as this is and using a palette knife whereby you can cover a very large area in a short amount of time, not for the business of speed, because there are many programs that are talking about people who can do paintings in a half an hour. Uh, I'm not interested in hearing that the speed is what motivates the need to, to have a, a quick technique. What I'm dealing with is the business of weather changes and the light and the sky conditions that change very rapidly when you're out of doors. So if you can develop a technique that is going to give you speed as well as um, clarity, then th that's how palette knife work is going to uh, be very satisfactory and also produce some very interesting results. Um, you work, of course, from the darkest, from the most distant place towards the foreground. And the most distant place in this instance has absolutely no interruptions whatsoever, such as uh, clouds and um, birds and so on. We may put some birds in later if they happen to pass by. So we have a very pale blue, a mixture of white, cerulean blue, and a touch of ultramarine is the way I got this color. And I'm going to now proceed on to the distance. It is still very early spring. There's almost nothing of color going on out there. And so uh, Long Island has its own particular um, atmosphere at this time of year. And it is um, absolutely a no-no to fake it and to think, well, it looks a little dull out there. I think I'll put something brighter in it. Um, no, you follow what you see if you're a realist painter, which I am. I'm now, I'm now mixing up, and it's turning green as we go along, but I'm going to subdue it with some alizarin crimson and try to get that strange um, non-color that is in the distance uh, right now. Uh, it's a little bit dark, so I'm going to add some, some uh, white and some cerulean blue and see whether or not I can mix a color which comes close to my subject matter, which is a, well, it's a lot of mauve in it. There's a lot of purple. Let me, let me squeeze some more white because um, wh this, uh, this kind of painting eats, eats paint up very rapidly. And you have to be willing to spend a tube of white, maybe. This is a pound tube. I, I only buy pound tubes of white because you need so many. These are three or four ounces, and that's all you need for the vibrant colors. But the white, you definitely have to supply yourself with a lot of color. Um, back to the mixing. As you can see, it takes some thorough mixing, at least the way I like to see it done. Because I, as I said before, I don't want to rely upon um, accidentals at this point. Well, here is a kind of a non-color. Let's see if it's dark enough for the um, for the color against which it's going. No, I do not feel that that is dark enough. So I'm going to add some more 
uh, magenta and a touch more um, ultramarine blue and see if I can darken it just a little bit, not too much. As you can see, all colors are reusable uh, with this technique. So you don't waste, uh, you waste less colors. You may use, think you use a lot more, but actually the, the, point, the point is that you really waste uh, uh, a lot less because you can always use the ones that are on your palette. I feel that that's probably a, uh, a, a fairly good color to choose. And as you can see, there is a nice interpretive quality to this kind of um, uh, technique whereby uh, when there is a, um, a, a clump of trees in the distance that sort of protrudes a little bit further than the other, it does not need to be specific and exact. It just needs to have the general anatomy of that distance there. And if it rises a little bit over here and then there may be uh, uh, silhouetted against the sky, one, one, one isolated tree, then, then that can be put in. But I want to emphasize that this kind of painting is um, uh, full of texture and full of um, spontaneity. So uh, th th there's a great deal of interest in, this ca in, in palette knife painting. Uh, however, it, it's not to be mistaken that it is easy. It is, uh, it is just as complex as any other type of painting. It's just different. So there is a little bit of darkness down by the base of this land mass, and I'm going to put that in now with uh, hopefully just a few, ju ju just a, a nice um, pulling of the color across the camera. A nice close-up will show you what I mean by pulling of the color across the canvas, um, giving you um, giving you a sort of a nice, um, uh, well, it's, an, uh, it's arbitrary and it looks accidental, but actually it is layers of color, which I find is the most important part of this kind of painting, is to do it in layers. Uh, I, I applied the uh, distance color over as a layer on top of the blue, and then came the, uh, the sort of non-color, and now comes the darker one, which is down towards the land. So we have three colors. Uh, uh, the uh, sky has immediately receded uh, into the distance by introducing the dark color of the land mass. And so that's what you call color focus, that the d paleness of the sky and the darkness up against it has made the sky recede. It's also in many, in many uh, uh, people's terminology, it's called contrast. Actually, what it is, is uh, optical illusions that take place with um, color. That the, that the pale makes it look as though it's far away. Now I'm going to put the, I'm going to, uh, I've mixed some, uh, some cadmium uh, yellow and some white, and that's going to be my, uh, my pale color, which is um, visible in a very tiny, uh, thin strip against the, uh, against the dark land mass for the, for the beach areas. And I'm, as you can see, I'm using the same palette knife and I'm getting, I can get thin if I want to by using the side. Oops. And I can, well, that'll, that can come off. And, oh, I better not talk because I'm trying to get this done in one stroke. The, um, the, um, the, the, the nice thing about palette knife is that the less you fool with it, the better it looks. And that's almost the same thing as a pie crust. The less you mangle the pie crust, the lighter it will be. And the less that you mangle these colors, the better the um, feeling of the spontaneity of the uh, uh, palette knife technique is. Um, I'm going to show you that with this dark color that is in my way, I'm going to remove it and put it on the side of the palette to be used at another time. This means that I can clean the field, which is the center of any palette, clean the field so that I can mix some colors on it and this is some, many times not something that you can't do with a brush. You tend to get the colors very badly uh, mixed together when you deal with the brush. But here, as you can see, here is my, here's my palette knife, all bright and shiny in the light. There's no paint left on it, therefore it's not going to get itself all into the next color, which is going to be the color of the water. I'm going to uh, squeeze some more white out, take a very short break because I'm, well, there's no sense in you watching me squeeze paint out. That's no fun. I'll be right back, so.
back again to continue with our study of Little Bay in Setauket with a palette knife. Um, I'm I've been working from the background towards the foreground, as you know, that is the technique, and I've gotten four bands of color. Uh, one, two, three, four. Let me uh, let me introduce a fifth color to give you a feeling of the season. This, there is a there is an introduction of some slightly yellow ochre and orange tones in the distance there, which means that it's going to give you some some kind of mysterious interest and wondering you know what uh, what is that back there? But that's the point of the of, of painting. And if anybody is familiar with Monet with Mon Monet's paintings of his water lilies, you will find a tremendous amount of mystery in the color that he uses. And if anybody is not familiar with it, then it would be a, a wonderful idea for, for you to familiarize yourself with some of Monet's paintings, um, because he was the, he was the supreme uh, um, impressionist. Um, I now, have now mixed a color for the water which is darker, and as, one can, as I can observe from my subject matter, the, um, the water is darker than the sky. It's, uh, it is a phenomenon that takes place. Uh, sometimes when, when weather conditions are of a particular kind. And today, with a very pale sky, the, the water was quite dense and dark. I'm not sure if it's because of the temperature of the water or the surface disturbance um, uh, at this time of year, but um, I've got to have to hold this very carefully here because it seems to, be, it seems to have come apart there. Well, these are the these are the problems that you run into when you're, especially when you're working out of doors. The wind can blow, and all of a sudden your canvas moves. So be always be ready to um, jump in there and try and save save the day. Uh, wh when we were out there, uh, some people came by to say hello. The police came, wondered what we were doing there with the camera, and another young friend of mine came by and. Um, very in, in in very close uh, uh, tune with the uh, wildlife um, uh, that's down there, and there were some oh Canada geese flying overhead, and there were some swans that should be appearing any minute now, and um, there were all sorts of wonderful things happening on the water. And he's a kind of an environmentalist, and so he was talking about. Uh, a man who is the president of the Pine Barrens Association, who is uh, very involved with trying to save the remarkable conditions that we have here on Long Island uh, and the work that the Pine Barren Society is doing. If anybody's interested in that, just write me a postcard here at the cable station and I'll write to you the best I can of what I know of what's going on with our environment here on Long Island, which I paint all the time. And uh, I can't just paint it and not pay attention to the fact that it's here and uh, with uh, all the hope in the world that it will not change appreciably uh, within the next few hundred years. Here I'm going, I've mixed some very dark blue, which is some uh, ultramarine blue and cerulean mixed with a little bit of white. And I'm going to pull this um, uh, palette knife across the canvas to give you a very dark area, which is uh, a wind disturbance. And I like to do it in just one pull because this is what I called layer painting before. And I believe that you can see that you have to mix it, and then you have to be just very slow with it. And whatever takes place, you can do some corrections later if you don't like certain things that have happened. But the wise thing to do is to just leave it as it is and let whatever strange little knobs and bumps that this palette knife picks up as it goes across be what it is. Because water changes every few seconds, especially on a day like this when the wind was slightly high. And um, the, uh, the water disturbances are what, you want, what you're going to be trying to get with this technique. I think that you, um, you uh, will find that paying attention to the water disturbances that you're going to get a better understanding of what it is that takes place out there. Here, uh, every once in a while, there is a very fine line of, of little wavelets on the top. And other times, it's going to be quite pale. And I see that in the distance there, there is a very pale one. I'm going to mix some very pale blue and run it across the, uh, run it across the canvas with a, a different palette knife, a thinner one. And uh, here it is. Let me show you the thinner one. This is the thinner one. It's long, much longer, and much skinnier than the other one. 
and it's going to um, it's going to act as a uh, as a fi uh, such as a finer brush would do. A thinner brush would do the same kind of thing. Now, somewhere in the distance here on the water, there is a pale area. I hope that the uh, that the camera can pick up the subtlety of the difference of these colors, because. This is what makes uh, water paintings interesting, is the variety of colors that you get with a single tone. In other words, people say, well, water is blue. Well, water is blue and blue and blue and different shades of blue at all times. Uh, not just in the South Pacific, but right here on our own home ground of Long Island, you will find that the water changes a great deal uh, with, the year, with, the, with the days uh, of the year. The winter time, the water quality is different than it is in the summertime, and so it is also different than what it is in the spring. Uh, when I when I laid this uh, this uh, pic, pa painting out, uh, I said that there was an inlet here. Well, time has gone by. The camera uh, was set up for 20 minutes or 25 minutes, and you can see that the inlet has now been completely. Um, uh, has disappeared because the tide is going out and it's revealing some of the land. So there's land here, uh, which, it, which makes me reiterate that we are working from life in an electronic way. Um, so uh, here is the, here's the color of some of the water in the foreground. I'm putting it on in a different way, scraping it down as I go. And as it comes nearer, it becomes darker. Uh, it, it's a strange phenomenon. I don't quite understand why it becomes darker as it comes nearer, because uh, it's shallower, and you would think that it would become paler, but it doesn't. And so, and it also becomes slightly mauve. A little bit of purple is involved there, and I'm going to uh, mix some magenta to be able to get the darkness that I want, which is very dramatic on a day like this. And here is the the uh, the wonderful. Uh, almost almost mauveish blue quality of the water in the foreground and is coming up and making patterns of waves that do this because of uh, obviously because of the wind let me see if i can get this um here the, it, the, there is a pattern in these little wavelets that are and i believe that the monitor will show that that that, that is the general direction of these of the way the water is flowing, even though it's in a if it's in a still place, they are flowing in this direction towards the land. And a uh, palette knife enables you to uh, do these patterns with um, a much more a much freer style than if you would do, do it with a brush. So as it approaches the land, it becomes quite dark, and the little r wavelets are are working their way towards the land. Um, there is some uh, alizarin crimson in this blue that I mixed, which is what makes it really quite vibrant. Uh, blue is never darkened with, uh, with black or with umber. It's always darkened with the color next to it or the one on the opposite wheel, like the opposite of the wheel. The opposite of blue, of course, is orange, but that subdues it. It doesn't darken it. All right, um, the wavelets seem to continue towards the land this way. The, the, I'm using the thinner palette knife, and as you can see, whatever happens to come off in these motions is I'm leaving it. Um, because, as I said, water is in continuous motion, and uh, you try to catch it as it goes in its, in its pattern. Uh, it's observance. Uh, these, uh, the, the, this is a kind of an observance that you do not see when you're watching programs that are working out of the imagination, uh, you 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 don't get these you don't get these fine details nor the instruction on to, as to how to do them. Towards the land here, I see that there's a little bit of darkness that has, um, for some reason or another, manifested itself against the sand, and it's in that same kind of round pattern with the little wave coming this way. And as you can see, I'm not paying that much uh, attention to minute detail. I'm just trying to get the flavor of it. Now, if these are too strong, I'm going to remove them later because they are, after all, extremely subtle. And, you, and I don't want to do anything that is going to uh, compromise the simplicity of this, of this composition. I see there that there is a white uh, figure, a bird, is in the water. I believe it's a swan. And I'm going to put in 
just this white figure that I, there it is, um, before it goes away. This is what you learn to do when you are working from life. You learn to drop what you're doing and try to catch something that you know isn't going to last very long. So uh, as long as it's there and you just try to get the general shape of it. Uh, I'm not doing an, an anatomical study of that swan. I'm doing merely an impression of what it's like. Uh, with, of course, with some paying some attention to the general form of it, but it is it, it can't be overly detailed. If the head is too big, I can remove some of it because the paint is still wet, and I don't need that much. And the neck may be a little bit too thick, so you pull some of it off. These are corrections which I find are vital to 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 tell people how to go about doing this. Well, it's obvious that this uh, project is, can't possibly be uh, done in a short period of time of one half hour. So we're going to be do the, uh, I'm going to do this program in two parts. This is the first part. Um, uh, th the next uh, program that you see following this one, hopefully it will be consecutive, you will find out how I'm going to wind up the foreground of a study uh, of a local scene in Setauket called Little Bay. Uh, I hope that you got something out of this program, uh, a few little tips here and there, and a general uh, attitude about how you work from life right here in your own environment. Uh, thanks very much for watching. Uh, don't forget to tune in. Whenever you see Cable Easel announced in the papers, I'm always here trying to help out with the would-be painters. Bye-bye. Pat Windrow saying thanks for watching. <laughs>